it's just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Gaurav Joshi, BDS, MS, PhD, FICD. He works as a senior product manager at GC America, where he manages direct and indirect restorative portfolios. He's passionate about innovation in dental materials and technologies. He leverages his clinical knowledge and scientific expertise to lead marketing and education programs at GC America. He serves as a reviewer for several reputed dental journals, such as Operative Dentistry and Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. He's committed to continuous learning and currently pursuing an MBA program because he needs more initials after his name. Outside of his professional commitments, he enjoys spending time with family, outdoors, group exercises at Orange Theory, love that place, and reading Yelp reviews to find the best places to eat. Multidisciplinary background, proven ability of managing projects in a fast-paced environment, experience in building collaborative relationships with universities, industries, and KOLs. Uh, GC America is the leading private manufacturer of professional consumable dental products and the fastest growing dental company in the world. Founded in 1992, GC America is a wholly owned subsidiary of GC Corp, the world's fourth largest dental company, which has been based in Tokyo, Japan, since it was founded in 1921. I went there with uh, three of my boys when I was lecturing in Japan a couple of times and wow. did uh, four or five podcasts on location. It was just such a, it's, God, I love Japan. In 2014, recipient of the Deming Prize for Total Quality Management. Uh, GC America is the first U.S. dental company and only the fourth company in the United States to earn the world's oldest and most widely recognized total quality world award. GC America has exciting growth and expansion plans. Uh, my gosh, your resume goes on and on. And you've worked at, at uh, Glidewell. I, I love Jim Glidewell. Been there. We met there before. And um, you also worked at the ADA on their uh, on their product. Uh, yes, evaluation, evaluation well, side. man, you, uh, you are just, you have such a wide range of experience, uh, in dentistry. Congratulations on your career. Um, thank you, Howard. And it's my pleasure to be here. So basically, um, we, um, indirect restorations, is that bigger for you? Is that a bigger market than direct? Which one's bigger, indirect or direct? That's a good question. So uh, GC traditionally uh, uh, glass anoma restorative. That's uh, we have a seventy five percent market share in that category, and but also GC is known for cements. Uh, uh, so glass so in, and cements fall under indirect restorative workflow. So on both sides and and yeah, those are our I would say our bread and butter, but at the same time, GC has many quality products in both direct as well as indirect restorative workflow, like composite resins, our genial line, and on the, uh, and we are also developing new CAD CAM materials. Uh, so it, also we are expanding our indirect portfolio as well. And I've always thought it was you know, the reason I love architecture and dental materials, the dentistry is that, you know, you, you know, every human needs a bathroom and a window and a door, but you go around to all the different countries and they're always slightly different. Like a toilet in Vietnam is just slightly different than one in India. And, um, and it's the same thing in dentistry where glass automer is much bigger in J Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, than you know, some parts of the world, like in the United States, um, uses a lot less glass automer than, say, Japan and Australia and New Zealand. Do you, do you see that um, around the world, and what do you attribute that to? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's related to uh, what is taught in dental school, I would say, and what is what are the trends, uh, geographic trends, I would say. But that's becoming less and less with uh, social media, and uh, dentists are learning from. Uh, from the techniques all around the world. Uh, so definitely there is different. In Australia, there is a lot of lot more use of glass ionomer and sandwich technique. But re recently I saw a, a survey by clinicians report and they did a survey in 2015 uh, with dentists and glass ionomer use was very less like 30% uh, of dentists. And then they did it again in 2021, and uh, now it's 70%. So, uh, in how so, many yeah. years? In how many years? 
in in maybe six or seven years. So it grew uh, from thirty to seventy percent. Yeah, the, so that wow. uh, there was significant difference uh, that their two surveys showed, and it could be uh, because of more awareness. But at the same time, when people say glass anomer, they are not specific whether you are they are using a cement. They could be using it as a Fujisan cement, and they can still call it glass anomer. So that maybe the and Fuji is such a common name, like uh, and there are so many products with Fuji uh, brand, uh, with different versions that they may be they may not be specific in what they what they're replying in the survey so that could be one of the reasons but yeah there, there is more awareness and we are seeing more growth in this category and i also uh you're right about social media social media is huge and um i think i think it also a lot of dental companies um you can't call something um mcdonald's in america and then call it burger king in australia they they really need to uh try to get one name for around the world or one name with a logo or whatever, because I've seen a lot of people, you could tell they're confused because they don't realize they're talking about the same thing. I've seen that on dental town and it's like, okay, well that's the same product. It just has a different name uh, in Australia or New Zealand or, um, but uh, anyway, um, um, yeah, that, that's amazing. So what's, what's got you most excited at GC America now? What, what are you, what are you working on now? That's uh, really got you excited. So currently we are working on signature, GC signature workflows. So first of them we are working on is indirect restorative workflow. So it's just a comprehensive solution that will streamline the uh, uh, streamline indirect restorative procedures for dentists, reduce inventory, increase efficiency while ensuring a high quality that GC is known for. So we are looking at it in a more holistic way how these different quality products fit together to streamline the proceeding direct procedure and how's that going it's going great yeah so we are uh, receiving great response for uh, for this initiative uh, so starting from tooth preparation to delivering uh, the final restoration uh, there are many steps involved, and our our aim is to make this process, uh, make these steps more efficient, reduce the time, and increase efficiency. So, <clears throat> go over like like on preparation. Um, or a lot of the a lot of the success based on the preparation, and what what do you think? Uh, my dentist listening to you today. Uh, could learn about preparation techniques, especially dental students. Uh, absolutely. So preparation is a crucial step. Uh, so uh, like we learn in dental school, ad adequate resistance and retention form is necessary for the long-term success of the restoration. And this uh, resistance and retention from, form, I will speak from a technology perspective that or, or materials perspective uh, uh, being at GC. And uh, uh, first and foremost is we should follow the preparation guidelines for a particular material. So if it's uh, zirconia, we should follow the prep guidelines for zirconia. If it's a lithium disilicate, uh, the minimum prep requirements should be followed. Uh, so that's first and foremost. And then there are different techniques that will help uh, streamline this uh, workflow or make it more, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, there is a, a technique called deep margin elevation technique. And uh, so that just helps, uh, uh, we want to avoid subgingival margins in crown, but there are many situations where it becomes inevitable. And what you what can you do in these situations? So raising the sub the gingival floor using composite resin, using the curved Toffelmeyer matrix band, and uh, res, uh, uh, raising the floor to achieve proper isolation, and that will also uh, make the cleanup easier later. 
and we have solutions uh, like, uh, so there are many, we are talking about indirect workflow here, but there are many direct restorative products that make our life easy in indirect workflow. So composite resins, uh, uh, like uh, 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 highly filled, flowable composite resin, like genial, universal, injectable. So beauty of it is it you get the same strength of a universal composite, packable composite with this flowable because it's highly filled. And it has some amazing properties like uh, thixotropy. So what is thixotropy? Uh, uh, if you... If the check, uh, if uh, you are trying to get ketchup on your uh, in your burger, and you don't, it doesn't come out. If you just uh, try to get out uh, by uh, getting out of the bottle, then you shake the bottle, and then it becomes fluid, and you get it easily. So that's that's thixotropy. Thixotropy is when you it's change in viscosity of the material when you apply shear force to it. And that's what genial universal injectable does. When you, when you place it, it stays put. But when you apply pressure with instrument, when you apply shear force with instrument, composite instrument, it adapts to two. So apart from that, it, it, it can stack. It can really be stacked. Uh, it's a stackable composite. And also, it uh, it comes with long bendable metal tips, so you can get uh, it to the difficult to access areas. Especially, it becomes uh, essential when you are doing a, a deep margin elevation or subgingival margin. You want to uh, in less than second distal of second molar, and that's where that long metal bendable metal tip can help you to get the material where you want it to be. Uh, so, so yeah, the, 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 there are different di direct restorative solutions. Uh, uh, other solution uh, to get it, to get the material or get the tool to proper form, uh, uh, first you have to do core buildup. If it's a root canal treated tooth or severely damaged tooth before placing a crown, you need core buildup, and that's where fiber reinforced composites come into play. So these are different dentin replacement materials. Uh, they are reinforced by e glass fibers, just like steel uh, steel rebars used in con to to reinforce concrete in construction. Uh, and and they 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 really act. Uh, this research has shown that they really improve fracture toughness of the material. The crack has to go around the fiber uh, or, the, uh, so, uh, uh, or it's, it's called crack bridging mechanism in material science. So it, uh, it stops the crack or crack has to go around it. So the material, you do not see catastrophic failures as you would see with compos other composite resins, conventional composite resins. So some, some of these technologies uh, uh, can be used to really um, um, make your foundation, that's the preparation of, of, uh, on which you are going to place your crown stronger. You know, every periodontist I've had on this show has told me that, you know, only five percent of the referring dentists probably do 90 percent of their crown lengthening procedures and um I, you know it's a it's a billable procedure it's better for the long run you would think the high-end market i mean when you look at the fact that heck, your average truck is 100 grand that's all you see in arizona it seems like everybody has a toyota tundra or a ford 150 or 250 or 350 and uh i just think there's a, a lot bigger market for crown lengthening uh, then all these subgingival preps. I don't know if the dentist, I don't know why that is. Why do you think that is? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so crown lengthening procedure is more invasive, I would say. Uh, comparatively, deep margin elevation is less invasive procedure that dentists can uh, 
uh, most general dentists can do by themselves. Uh, so maybe there is a trend towards doing deep margin elevation uh, rather than uh, inviting periodontists and doing crown lengthening. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thought. Now, um, when I ask, when I'm lecturing in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, I ask them, why do you do like the sandwich technique, you know? And they, um, they always say that um, they just can't figure out why Americans don't want an active ingredient in their composite. And they, they see the, the, the fluoride um, in the glass onomer as an active ingredient. And then they see the inert composites that Americans do all day long. And they, they, they just don't get it. What would you, what do you, how do you weigh in on that? I mean, do you think, uh, do you think that's why they use glass onomer in the far East 10 times more than in America? Uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, maybe the fluoride release is uh, definitely important. But interesting thing is that in U.S., uh, fluoride release or there is less restrictions from FDA uh, on claiming fluoride release uh, in a, for FDA approval. So, uh, for example, in Europe, even glass anomers cannot claim that fluoride re uh, there is fluoride release and fluoride release will uh, will help in cavities so they are not allowed to make that claim but in the us you can in fact make that claim that uh, restoration uh, is really or restorative is releasing fluoride so again i don't know the exact reason why uh, it's maybe there are some uh, the i think the uh importance of key opinion leaders uh, and, or peers sharing these techniques with each other is very important if uh, uh if uh, glass anomers becomes mainstay uh, in the united states then and more people talk about it uh, about its benefit benefits of sandwich technique i think uh, we will see is more use of glass anomer in US as well. In Australia, there are many, uh, like for example, uh, uh, the uh, Dr. Graham and Dr. Uh, and NG, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce uh, his last name, NGO. It's the spelling is. No, yeah. yeah, Dr. No. Yeah, yeah. Dr. No, yeah. So, I had, uh, I had a lecture uh, to my study club in Phoenix, Arizona, like 30 years ago. He was just a, just an amazing wow. man. Um, you know, I've had, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I remember um, about, I don't know how long ago it was, 15, 20 years ago, um, the world had two earthquakes the same size, you know, pretty much at the same time. One was in LA and one was in Haiti. And in LA, no one died because of all those regulations and building codes that everybody complains about and complains about, especially the construction workers. And then in Haiti, like a quarter million people died. And you just, um, you know, um, Michael Miller used to tell me at Reality Magazine evaluating products that he said he, he just in shock that dentists don't read the instructions and they also don't use a, a time clock. Like, like the instructions will say brush on for 15 seconds and Michael will stand behind him with a stopwatch and just think, okay, that was three seconds. Um, you, uh, how did you get, you know, and the dentist that they, they don't read the instructions it, it's kind of more like art, they're cooking, they don't need a recipe, they don't need to look at, it, but they really do. And, um, you know, some of these, and then they mix kits too. Uh, they'll use, you know, the Bonnie agent from this box and a resin from another box. It's like, dude, dude, there is somebody, somebody with a bunch of letters behind their name. I mean, I, I, I've been to GC and Tokyo and, and in Chicagoland and, I mean, you guys got a, you're a PhD and a dentist. I mean, they, they got a lot of scientists that spent a lot of time working on this stuff. And then a lot of dentists just have a cavalier attitude toward it. You know what I mean? But yeah, every, there, there's gotta be a stopwatch in every deal. You gotta look at the instructions and it also really helps the assistant. Um, I remember Rolla Christian when, um, Thermophil came out and uh, from Tulsa dental products that got bought by Dentsply. Um, when they sent it to her, she called uh, the owner. And, um, she said, you know what I would do? I would stop and build the best little instruction card in the world. She goes, this is too complicated to read and everything. She goes, they need to see a five by seven, 
you know, index card that's laminated so you can wipe it off. And, um, and she, and she thinks that was a really big help and uh, reading the instructions and, and all that kind of stuff is big. So, um, yeah. so you want to talk about, uh, um, on your direct, on your indirects, um, you got the, uh, uh, Lisi, do you pronounce it Lisi? The lithium silicate, L I S I. Lisi block, yeah. Lisi block, and you yeah. got the Sarah Smart two seventy. Um, talk about those. Yeah, so Lisi block is a fully crystallized lithium disilicate block. Uh, so uh, it's a glass ceramic material. Glass ceramics are materials which, uh, as the name suggests, it has a glass face and crystals of ceramics embedded in it. And uh, lithium disilicate is uh, is well known glass ceramic material used in dentistry for more than a decade now. It's known for its it's a combination of strength and aesthetics. Uh, it provides that. But how GC has revolutionized this material is uh, now you don't need to fire it. You don't need oven for that. And how we accomplish that, how uh, scientists in Japan accomplish that is uh, they, you, uh, the material now has smaller crystals, densely packed submicron crystals uh, that, uh, that give is increased strength, but at the same time, uh, it can be milled in a fully crystallized state. So you save that over time, the, the total processing time uh, comes down to average 19 minutes as compared to 50 minutes in conventional lithium disilicates. So huge time savings uh, for dentists, uh, that, that extra chair time, they can relax or they can use it to get another patient in. And also for patients, that's a huge benefit. You instead of one and a half hour appointment time, if you can get crowned in less than an hour, forty five minutes, that's that's again they are uh, they are coming from work, uh, taking maybe some of them are taking a day off or some of them are taking uh, off a half day from work. For them also, for patients also, it's a huge benefit that you can get your treatment done in smaller amount of time. So, now, so that's your Lisi block. So you like the Lisi block, um, especially if it's a, uh, the tooth is ceramic antagonist, but, um, but you like the Sarasmart better if they have bruxism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so again, uh, Sarasmart is composite block. It's a high, we call it hybrid ceramic, but it's high pressure, high temperature, polymerized, composite resin uh, and uh, so uh, it it has more flex it is more flexible uh, as compared to ceramic ceramic as a class of material are more brittle as compared to composite resins which are which are more flexible resin polymer gives it more flexibility so for bruxers uh, the thought is that again the the uh, that it will absorb more force, uh, it will flex more, and as a result, it wouldn't break. It, it, it may deform a little bit, but it won't break. It, you won't see a catastrophic failure. So that's the reason we recommend it for Bruxer as compared uh, 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 these this uh, Cera Smart hybrid ceramic material. So on an indirect crown, um, mm -hmm. what percent of them are being done milled in the office versus uh, sending it to a traditional Crown and Bridge laboratory, and is that market growing? Uh, is is self milling, um, chair side milling? Is is it growing? Is it plateaued? How, how do you see that market as compared to uh, conventional Crown and Bridge labs? That's a great question. So, uh, uh, so I would say chair side CAD CAM market hasn't taken off as you would imagine. So it, the technology has been around for several decades now, but approximately 15% of dentists currently use chair side CAD CAM. Uh, there, are, there are more percentage of dentists who are using intraoral scanners, but they 
send the scan to the laboratory. Uh, so, and laboratory uses CAD CAM to uh, design and mill the crowns. Uh, so they outsource this to uh, laboratories. But overall, the uh, there is increase in these. Uh, it's going to only increase in the future because th the distinction between the lab, like, uh, uh, or I mean, many dentists are even doing 3D printed crowns or 3D printing. Uh, they have 3D printers in the office. So the trend is towards consolidating or doing everything in house, but, but the adoption has been gradual. Yeah, um, is it the same? I, I assume you were talking about the United States market. Um, yes. Is it suicide milling? Is it very different uh, in the other countries around the world? Or, or is it you see it about the same in the in the G twenty or how do you see it? Yeah, that, yeah, I I I I'm I'm more uh, familiar with the market here. Uh, I do speak with my European and Australian colleagues, uh, uh, but I think the biggest market is is in the US, uh, from what I understand. Uh, yeah, and, and same thing. So. <clears throat> Back to the the fifteen percent of dentists chair side milling. Um, what what percent of the dentists use uh, uh, the polishing wheels uh, or characterize it with uh, you know the the Lisi blocks with uh, the Lustre Pace one or the Sarah Smart with the Optiglaze color? Is mm -hmm. is that like what, what percent of the dentists are doing that? And and how how talk talk about that oh. for? Yeah, absolutely. So for uh, for Lisi block. Our tagline is mill polish place. So this material is designed for efficiency. Uh, it can, uh, you can you it because of the small crystal size I mentioned earlier, it polishes beautifully uh, within five minutes, approximately five minutes, and and so uh, ninety percent of the uh, times dentist. Uh, just polish them, and and it uh, so if it's uh, it's for posterior only, they are not concerned about characterization characterizing it as uh, much. But yeah, uh, there are other ten percent of times when they they may need they may think about uh, it may be in the aesthetic zone and uh, they may need, need to characterize it. And also the whole point of Lacy block is time savings. You don't need to put it in the oven. Uh, and if you want to glaze it, initial IQ, uh, initial IQ1 base, then you, you need to put it in the oven. So that kind of count, uh, I mean, then you add that time. Uh, it's not as much as the traditional process, but still, uh, it it uh, the total time is around thirty minutes. Uh, if you add that characterization step instead of nineteen minutes, if you polish, so it's not a huge difference. But uh, but yeah, if you don't need it in the let's say um, a first molar or second molar on lay, then probably polishing is enough. For uh, for Cira Smart is the same thing. Is the compo uh, is the composite block or hybrid ceramic block we call it. Uh, so it polishes beautifully, just like composite. So polishing is the trend. Uh, also, uh, uh, but and but uh, there is the option of optiglaze. So you can make it uh, look really beautiful with this uh, light cured resin coat. Uh, and uh, and optiglaze is actually uh, one of the leading products in that in that category uh, because it, it it is just amazing technology because it's a it's a liquid resin but it's very highly wear resistant these uh, it it is nano field uh, nano field resin and these uh, so when in material science as you decrease the particle slide, size they tend to clump together. But GC uh, has a technology, uh, we call it dispersion technology. So uh, these small nanoparticles, they do not clump together. They, they still are separated within 
liquid resin liquid so that's uh, so optic layers that's why how it's nanofield and provides a very high wear resistance so the gc um that stands for general chemical doesn't it general chemicals yes Gen general chemical um yeah uh, we say great company that's a great company <laughs> i love it I, you know, when you, when you talk about the time going faster, you know, I was born and raised in Kansas and when I got out of dental school, I almost stayed in Kansas just because they had that back then in 87, they had the expanded uh, function dental assistant, but I came to Arizona and it took them, you know, 25 years to get that pass. But my gosh, it was amazing in Kansas when anybody could have these EFTAs, but some dentists, you know, they'd have their one chair and they would do everything themselves with someone suctioning. And then there were other dentists who, my gosh, they, they would numb three rooms go back and then prep the three rooms and then go back to their private office for 45 minutes and drink coffee and play on dental town while the expanded function dental assistants just did everything and um and yeah. i always thought they um those eftas liked their job more because they got to do more in fact the only two dental assistants i had that i uh convinced i need to go to dental school and go through dental schools because when i was assisting them they would always be bumping my head with their head. And mm -hmm. sometimes they would, they would push my head back. And I, you saw about the face, like, I, I know you want to see, but I'm actually the dentist trying to do this dentistry. And they go, yeah, but I can't see. And I, I'm like, man, you are so into this. You have to go be a dentist. But I, I think that after dental assistants are they're, they're, they just seem twice as into dentistry um, as a regular dental assistant because they get to do more and, uh, and they yeah. gravitate towards dentists who, let them do their expanded functions. And um, I, I can't tell you how many dentists I know, they say, you know what, if, when, if I walk in the room and I got to do a quadrant of MOD composites, oh, I hate that because it's so tedious and there's no shortcuts and it's just an hour of solid work. And I'm like, man, you could just numb crap and leave the room with an EFTA. And I, I think they do. I really think their work is higher quality because as a dentist is looking at it, it's like, oh, I got to go mow the yard and do four MOD composites. Um, the, the assistant, they, they, they don't have to do a hygiene check. They, they schedule the, the amount of time they need. And it just, it just looks like it's just a better quality situation, uh, less burnout. You know, you, a dentist doing yeah. the, minimal most minimal skill procedure a bunch of, of fillings um when the assistant it's their maximum procedure it'd be like dentist doing a, a molar root canal a number two or pulling out four impacted wisdom teeth and they just they just love it what, what do you think the biggest mistakes are in cementation so cementation the biggest mistakes are uh using a proper cement for a proper prep so what i see is so there are two types of prep retentive preps and non-retentive retentive preps uh, looting is enough you do not need as an adhesive or bonding non-retentive prep you must use bonding agent to get uh, so for example onlay or or if there is a, a is a tempered prep or just a short stump left, may, uh, I, I have seen many dentists still use just looting. They do not use bonding for that, and that's where the failure occurs. So that one one of the major I would say uh, mistakes during cementation that understanding. Uh, which uh, the, pro, uh, the cement selection for proper uh, proper prep. So you know, uh, on a on a barrel, you go back to barrels. You know, a thousand years ago. You know how they had that ring of metal. You know that was all made by wood, and they put that ring of metal around the barrel. And you know what that ring of metal is called? A ferrule. A ferrule. And dentistry, we use a ferrule, but we stole it from, you know, beer kegs from, you know, 500,000 years ago. And man, if you can just get that two millimeter ferrule band, just think of a, a big barrel. I mean, if you didn't have that ferrule metal collar around there, the whole thing, you couldn't stack them 10 high. But that, that ferrule is everything. And we stole that from the, uh, the, the wine barrel makers. 
and uh dennis just gotta i guess they need to drink more wine so they don't forget about that uh that that feral um so uh <laughs> uh crazy um so what is um what what is your product launch now what what are you working on now uh, so uh is you're the, the product, best. you're the product manager uh yeah absolutely so it may uh, we do not we we have several products in pipeline but i uh they are in the uh, next generation next generation adhesives next generation restorative materials i cannot really speak the details because it will be too early uh, uh, but yeah we have several products in pipeline that make dentistry faster efficient and uh, and yeah e easier for dentists you know in america <clears throat> the dental meeting market is so fragmented because every state wants to have their own meetings and and um in europe it was the same thing but that fdi meeting in cologne germany <clears throat> where they just have it every other year every two years my gosh that, that it's the largest meeting in dentistry but i what i thought was so interesting about that is they do it every two years because the uh, for the next product launch so, you know the all the manufacturers said you know we we can't make something new every year it's going to take two years but what do you being the product manager at gc what do you think of that product cycle is it really about two years is what you need to go from an idea to a product launch or is it more like three or four or five so uh, you take uh, it takes minimum 18 months but more than that most times yeah it takes three to four years especially as a bigger companies they have many processes in place uh, also uh, in case of let's say uh, gc is a global company we have different markets uh, japan europe australia north america and getting inputs from all those markets and agreeing on product specific specifications that meet the requirements of all markets is a challenge sometimes sometimes we have uh, we have products developed specific to markets but most of the times we get more efficiencies and uh, uh, if we develop the market that we can uh, or develop the product that we can market all over the world so typically it i would say it takes two and a half or three years uh, from idea to uh, product launch uh, but it really varies depending on how complex uh, the product is when you talk about <clears throat> your core build up with fiber reinforced composite kind of like putting uh reinforcement metal when you're laying you know big concrete uh rebarb uh, is what we call it um do you see fiber post market growing or do you see the dentist still using the old-fashioned metal post or where, where do you where do you see that market yeah so post uh, the use of post has uh, declined over the years uh but there is uh, and with the help uh, with actually use uh, with uh, availability of these uh, fiber reinforced composites uh, dentists see less need for putting a post so post market has declined but there is obviously a need of these four build up materials and that market, I think, will keep on growing. There is also, uh, after COVID, uh, I saw the news on New York Times that there was epidemic of cracked teeth. So again, uh, something like cracked teeth, uh, uh, if you reinforce it with fiber reinforced material, it can increase the longevity of the material, uh, longevity, longevity of the tooth. So overall, this market is growing. Another advantage, and since you mentioned fiber reinforced, another advantage of that is uh, shrinkage. So these fibers also reduce the shrinkage stress. Uh, uh, Pascal Magne ha has done, uh, he has done uh, several studies on fiber reinforced materials and how they reduce the shrinkage and cusper deflection while when they are used for core build up. It's kind of funny because a lot of dentists will say <clears throat> they don't use a fiber uh, post cemented because they think the metal posts are stronger. But I've had 
50 endodontists on this program in the last seven years that said the the main purpose of a metal post is to fracture the tooth. And so it, there, there's a big schism there. The endodontists are saying, no, do not do this metal post. And if you got to do a post, do something more flexible like fiber. And then the, the dentists don't think the fiber is strong enough, but um, it's just fracturing, fracturing uh, the, the tooth. Um, so um, I, I think that was very interesting how you said that the rebarb um, prevented crack propagation, how, you know, the yeah. cracks got to go around it. That is, uh, that is some, is that, you figure that out with scanning electron microscope or, or what do you, what do you, how many, how, how much do you got to magnify that to be able to figure that out following a crack? So these, yeah. So these fibers are six micron in diameter and 140 micron in length so these are pretty small fibers uh, and and yeah it's a well-known mechanism uh, i mean we uh, i wish we had a clinical proof of that and there may be which i don't know uh, uh, but uh, but yeah this is well-known mechanism in material science that if you put a fiber in the material uh it reinforces it and we do a st we do a in vitro test for fracture toughness test so fracture toughness is the property of the material uh, that measures the resistance to crack propagation and uh, uh, fracture toughness of our flow uh, our fiber reinforced composite is almost two to three times more than conventional composite resin so that's how we know this is helping crack because factor toughness is two to three times higher than conventional composite. And you know, a lot of sensitivity <clears throat> from a temporary is just because of saliva leaking in there and, and uh, getting all contaminated. Uh, you guys also have that uh, immediate dent and sealing um, with G2 bond uh, um, or G premio. Um, what, what do you, what do you think of that? Do you, do you think that's mainly, um, to prevent against contamination, bond strength, or do you think it's mostly post-operative sensitivity? I think all three. It helps with all three. The research has shown that it helps with all three because when you apply this, uh, immediately seal the contaminated dentin, uh, so uh, it it helps with the increase in bond strength and also with the operative post-op sensitivity. You know, uh, and especially G pre sorry, uh, one more point I uh, I remember was especially G premium bond it has a very thin film thickness that that helps with uh, so one of the concerns dentists often have is the thickness of the bonding agent and if whether it will affect the fit of the restoration leg, fit of the crown, and here we have very thin layer uh, of G premium bond, and that really helps in this technique. So, sorry, uh, you were saying something? No, um, I, I, I think that's good. I, I think that, um, you know, if you're a really, really good dentist, you know, you, you get to do dentistry, but so many times you have to be an armchair psychologist. And you, you see the question all the time on Dental Town, like, you know, uh, you know, you see them in a crown a week later, they're coming back, and, you know, they, they've come back three times and and uh man i'll tell you that the, the most important and most expensive medicine in the world is a tincture of time and uh my gosh people just they don't understand the healing uh phase of it and you really got to set their expectations i mean satisfaction equals perception minus expectation i always would tell them okay now we just did a big filling and we are we just did a crown or whatever and you know th this is going to be sense i mean i just beat the hell out of your tooth and you know this this tooth's going to talk to you and it may talk to you for you know a long time so you know it, don't get uh you know come back in and see me if you want to talk about it you know we can adjust the bite or check the bite or check things but even if the bite's perfect i mean you know we we drilled on the tooth at half a million rpms i mean it's not going to it's not going to be pretty. And my friends that are in cosmetic surgery, oh my gosh, they said that um, they wish they just would have been a, a cosmetic psychologist because after, you know, they, they, you know, they go in there at 50 and they think they're going to walk out of there at 25 and now they have all this sore and pain and it's not like they wanted. And, 
man, setting expectations uh, for a surgery. And, and dentists are all surgeons. Only only 10% of MDs actually do surgery on people. 90% don't. Whereas dentistry, we're all surgeons. In fact, I don't even know why they, they should call the, the MDs physicians and they should call the dentist surgeons. I mean, it started out as a, as a barber dental surgeon and uh, it, it's all surgery. So you have to deal with so much post-op and, and sensitivity, yeah. and getting your techniques. Um, you know, I always like, like when I talked about, when I think about bonding agents or techniques or whatever, I always prioritize what's going to have the last post-office sensitivity. I don't want this talking to the patient for six weeks because then I'm going to have to talk to them. And, and uh, when you tell people, you know, it just got to give us some time. They don't, they don't want to hear that. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. So what other, um, to the young kids that you, you talked about earlier that um, most of the kids, and I, I believe it, use the products they use in dental school. I mean, I paid all that money for that dental education at UMKC and, and they had all these products and materials. And I used to think that was the best marketing decision they ever made because I was brand loyal for decades, decades. I mean, I had had something yeah. really wrong. I, you know, and they, they say on, on dental town, we've proven with a thousand polls that um, um, word of mouth referral from their dental colleagues is what's driving any dental market. If all the research says, take the blue pill, and your best friend says, no, it's the red pill. They're going to take the red pill. They, they, they trust this dentist because uh, they're doing it. And, um, but um, yeah. So are you, re are you putting a lot of this in dental schools and what are your challenges with dental students? And, uh, um, and how, how's that market going? Uh, so yeah, we are, uh, we are, uh, yes. Uh, as you said, dental school. Uh, yeah. That's where, dentists learn these techniques and materials and that's the great way of uh, introducing them to uh, do these materials and techniques but one more thing uh, another place where we are concentrating on is uh, dental support organizations so many dentists uh, so the trend is they do not start pra their own practice right away so after graduation uh, at least for a few years, they work for DSOs, or some of some of them work for DS. Like the 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 penetration of DSOs is increasing uh, over over the period of time. So our we are also focusing on these dental support organizations. That, that's where more many young dentists work after they graduate and getting into these uh, uh, these practices and these our men uh, just like Listy block efficiency uh, and dso's love that because they can increase their practice efficiency production and uh, so uh, along with dental schools that is another uh, area where we are focusing and getting these young dentists uh, acquainted with our materials and, you know, uh, there's so much benefits from standardization. I mean, like you go into any McDonald's, it's two LB patties, special sauce, cheese, lettuce, onion on a sesame, but it's a standardized product. And, but dentist, you know, they, they got eight years. They say the best employees um, did not finish high school. You know, you want 18 and under at Walmart or in the military or the Navy, they just follow orders. And as you get older and more educated, you don't, you're not good at following orders and you are, and these DSOs, you would not believe their biggest clinical problem. Even if I told you what it was, you'd, you'd laugh. Um, they can't get them to all the dentists in one office to agree on just five burrs for a crown prep. It's like, really? You need 50, you need 17 burrs to do an MOD composite. Are you kidding me? And you listen to them and that's why they went to school and they're working with their hands and they tell you all they need everything. It's like, yeah, but I mean, think about the poor dental assistant. She's working with four dentists in this group practice and one needs 17 burrs to do a filling and one, one only needs three. And I, I don't know. It's, I, I think the only solution is I, I, I tell them all, I say, well, you know what, <clears throat> since it's so stressful in your office, just tell the dentist to suck it up buttercup and they're in charge of getting their own burrs. Just give them a burr block and, you know, just set it up and he, they, he or she can go in there and grab their own burrs. Cause it just drives the assistants insane. And, and, uh, you know, all the, all the burrs they need, but 
it's cute and funny and artistic, but man, it is a challenge on these DSOs. And by the way, shout out to the DSOs. Um, when I got out of school, the only place you could get a job is with the government. I mean, you Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, public health, Indian public health service. Um, there wasn't that many options. So unless you came from the the ovarian lottery club where your mom was a dentist, um, you know, you, you're stuck with the, the military. And uh, now these kids come out and they complain about DSOs law, but man, they sure hire, they'll, they'll, they'll hire the entire graduating class, uh, especially in the urban cities. They're not much into rural, uh, but, but I also think they're good. I think competition helps any industry. And man, I saw that in, um, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, when clear choice came in and started just all these 20 minute advertisements on all on fours and they were charging 25,000 art. So here they are on TV, a $50,000 all on four, 20 minutes long. Every dentist, oral surgeon, periodontist told me, Oh my God, since they've been running all those ads, that market share just growing, growing, growing. Cause they see it on TV. Then they think, I wonder if my dentist does that. And um, so, and then the consumer hours, I mean, you know, um, like I said, when I got here in 87, if you, on a Sunday, if you fell off your bike and broke your arm, the hospital's open 24 hours a day. And, uh, but the dentist, you know, good luck finding a dentist on Sunday. And the DSOs, man, they rolled up here and the consumer got seven to seven, seven days a week. Um, and that's another interesting thing I um, find very interesting about Asia, the different delivery system where, you know, you go to Sing Singapore or Cambodia or Vietnam. Um, they all have a dental hustle. They all have a, 15 story building in downtown. This is dental hospital. And the first four floors are general. Then they got a floor for each one of the specialties. And when people have a dental accident, they, they just go to the hospital. If it's tooth related, they go to the dental hospital, anything broken on the face and jaws and all that. They just go to the dental hospital and, and um, no one's done that in the United States. I always wondered why uh, nobody saw that business model. And, uh, and then, then when I go to these hospitals around here in Phoenix, they say, you know, at least uh, 10, 15, 20% of all their emergencies are dental in origin. And they tell them, you know, we, we don't do dentistry here. And I, and I always thought that's so weird. I mean, if 15 or 20% of all the customers at Costco wanted a product, well, I'm pretty damn sure Costco would sell them that product. And I always wondered, like, what is the deal with a hospital? You can deliver a baby, have a heart attack, amputate a foot but you can't fix a tooth. Why, why is that? So why, why, why is that? I mean, talk about mental roadblocks, but yeah, I, I know if you come back yeah. to Phoenix in a hundred years, I mean, this city, just the city limits of Phoenix, not, not the Valley. The Valley is like 4 million, but just the city limits of Phoenix grows a hundred thousand people every year since, you know, for, for 10 years in a row or more. And uh, so I know if you come back in a hundred years, there's going to be a dental hospital in downtown Phoenix. That's going to be, you know, 15, 20 stories tall. Uh, but uh, cause I, I, I've seen it and the, the other countries, they love that stuff. Well, um, my gosh, I can't believe how fast uh, the, the time went. Is there, uh, yeah. is there anything you wanted to talk about that I didn't bring up? Uh, uh, yep. Yeah, we pretty much covered everything, uh, but uh, uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to bring uh, everyone watching this podcast, uh, bring their attention to GC America website. And we have uh, what we talked today about indirect restorative uh, workflow. We have a nice, uh, nice web page that uh, has all the resources, all the technique videos related to uh, different procedures and materials and how they work together to provide efficient uh, procedure. So uh, please feel free to check out that workflow. Uh, that, that, that would be my... Uh, and if you go to Dentaltown and you type in on the search GC America, or you can put in the um, LISI, uh, Lee C block uh, for lithium silicate block, there's some great threads. I know you've posted a lot of times on Dentaltown and I... Uh, Thank you for always uh, answering GC America questions uh, at Dentaltown. Uh, you know, it's uh, my it's, pleasure. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for all that you do for dentistry. And uh, my final question for you is you have probably the most perfect teeth that's ever been on this show. Do you think that's why you uh, fell in love with dentistry and became a dentist? Because 
you fell in love with your own smile? Was that a big part of it or what drove you to dentistry? So, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, so when I'm, uh, uh, yeah, my career has been a journey uh, that I never expected. Uh, so, uh, first of all, yes, I came to dentistry because I, I wanted something that will, uh, that will be, uh, that will really make me, uh, make use of my, like so, something which is combination of art and science. And then I was more interested when I went to dental school, I got more fascinated by science and technology side of dentistry. And that's why when I came to U.S. to uh, get uh, do my research in biomaterials, and that led to my interest uh, working for a dental company and my interest on the business side of dentistry. So I just uh, one opportunity led to other, and I was open to embrace those opportunities. Uh, yeah, so that's how. Yeah, but. To answer your question, yeah, I went, uh, I visited my family uh, dentist and I, I was fascinated. I went there for observership before I uh, went to dental school and I was fascinated by dental procedures and that's how I decided to get into dentistry. Uh, and my uh, smile came later. I had a big diastema, uh, midline diastema until the age of 20. Uh, 25 or 27 and then uh, I got it fixed uh, several years ago uh, with invisible aligners yeah that's another big <laughs> trend I I uh Invisalign is right here in uh, Tempe Arizona and they got a big building and I mean just just what a huge company I thought that was most interesting I mean, going back 20 years ago I could be eating at any restaurant with my boys around the world and if the waiter or waitress found out that um, that we were here at a dental convention, first thing out of their mouth was Invisalign. I mean, that 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 was the biggest brand grown in my, I mean, when I graduated, you already had Pepsi, you already had Pepsi and Coke, Crest and Colgate and Listerine, and you already had pretty much all the big brand names. So I'd say that Invisalign brand was the biggest brand ever built in my professional lifetime. I mean, it was just, oh my, and that's why they didn't make a lot of, of money. I mean, you know, for a lot, a lot of years, they had like, you know, they're, they're, they had a PE ratio of like 99 times earnings. The stock was so uh, multiple, but it was because they were spending so much money in growth. You know, when Jeff Bezos did that with Amazon, everybody clapped. And then when it uh, did the same thing in Invisalign, everybody's like, you know, hey, where's your profitability? And, uh, but hey, thanks for all you do. And I'm sure I'll see you around. You're everywhere. So I'll. I'm sure I'll write yeah, it. Th thank you so much for having me. It was it was really a pleasure talking with you. Ah, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Howard.